Mornstead and the greater Oathlands beyond share a history rich in virtue and heresy, stained by blood's crimson flow. It's a land that has seen tumult, known oppression, and suffered atrocity. Humanity, in its quest for self-awareness, has struggled against the tyrannies of gods, shattered through violence their chains, risen to dominance, and succumbed to perfidy. The story of Lords of the Fallen is grand but convoluted, due in part to the distance between game releases and their somewhat inconsistent continuities. This video intends to bridge the gap between games, enlighten the backdrop of events, and detail the machinations that transpire surrounding the 2023 game, a warning that major spoilers are to come. From the ancient rule of a spiteful god, to the ascension of humanity, to the founding of Mornstead and the Hallowed Sentinels, I hope to paint a vibrant, conclusive image of Lords of the Fallen's harrowing environs. Let's dive in. Before civilizations rose, before life suffused the land, while time and space were in protean infancy, gods ruled the realms. It cannot be said with certainty how many existed in the primordial pantheon of the universe, but each god manifested as foundational elements and dwelt within a realm distinct and separate from each other. In this universe, silence and stillness reigned. But the time of darkness was suddenly cast into brilliant illumination when the god Aureus, father of angelic radiance, beheaded himself in a ritual sacrifice that birthed the sun, the moon, and the heavenly firmament above, bathing all in the warm light of creation. From the distinction of light and dark, life and death followed. Creatures stirred, sentience coalesced, and mortal civilizations rose that worshipped the gods around them. The god of bounty, of verdure, growth, and vitality, known as the first of the beasts, stalked primal forests. Its worshippers revered nature, traces of which can still be found in the culture of remote Uteranger, where shamanic warriors offer thanks and seek the beast's boons. In opposition to the first beast stood the putrid mother, goddess of death, stagnation, and rot, who dwelt within the dark abyss of Umbral, realm of the perished. In her cold embrace, the Nohuta, an ancient and enigmatic race, found salvation. For centuries, Nohuta, their minds twisted to madness by the putrid mother's grace, devoted themselves to their deity, united in singular purpose. In a realm distinctly disparate from Umbro's cold stillness, seething with chaos, fire, and raw passion, the god Adir ruled absolutely. But Adir's realm was unpopulated. The god's vanity demanded throngs of loyal supplicants. From this land of conflagration, Adir cast his gaze upon the lands of mortals and found within humanity's nascent soul a fiery people who shared his tempestuous disposition. Greed, aggression, contempt burned hot in the hearts of humankind, and without a strong force to guide them, devolved into lawlessness and barbarism. They were a force untamed, much like Adir's own realm, and in them he saw worshippers eager to please a redeeming god, one who would save them from their own debauchery, and he desired devoted praise worthy of his power. To this end, Adir manifested physically in the mortal realm and bestowed his gift of magnanimous rulership upon mankind, who either willing or unwilling had no choice but to accept. Thousands bent knee in his awesome presence. Adir whispered words dripping with duplicity to turn the hearts of the masses, and zealots flocked to his newly established religion, but there were those who resisted. Adir's rise as humanity's god holds two very disparate interpretations. Many saw his coming as a blessing, believing his rule and worship would lead to great opportunity, to promised salvation. In the words of the devout, a deer will save you, listen, learn, pray, a deer will hear, a deer will help, you are safe with him. Others saw in a deer not a benevolent savior, but rather a malevolent oppressor, an infernal god of darkness and chaos that corrupted pure souls, that stripped mankind of its freedom, that lied, killed, and tortured 
all for his own amusement. Though his religion and acolytes commanded immense power, it is this latter view that festered in minds. Discontent against the anguish forced upon them by the vile god stoked thoughts of subversion, the sparks of which ignited into rebellion roughly 1,500 years before the present day. Humans would no longer tolerate enslavement beneath a deer's yoke, would no longer tolerate their wills bound to another. Rallying cries rung out across the land to depose a god, but a deer wouldn't relinquish control so easily. And how do mere mortals defy the immortal will of supreme beings? To combat the upstart rebellion, a deer enlisted adherents completely devoted to his religion. They saw their brothers and sisters as heretics wayward in soul rather than heroes, guilty of the worst transgression, resisting God's will. They readily armed themselves against the rebels, aided by a gift from a deer himself. From his native realm, the deity conjured the Rogar into existence. Rogar are Yadir's demonic and chaotic progeny, born of fire and imbued with savage emotions of pain, hatred, fear, and suffering. They're lamentable creatures bound to Adir's will, incapable of untold destruction. As the charred Lord Armatink states, Rogar are born in fire, their bodies tempered by Adir's inferno the intensity of which would reduce any typical human body to ash. And the item description of Light Reaper flesh suggests that Rogar have no will of their own, created only to enact their master's grim designs. Legions of Rogar, bolstered by loyalists, descended like wildfire upon the rebels. Hope against such impossible odds seemed grim, but then, Three beings of great renown and unparalleled ability made themselves known from the ranks of human despondency. As this recovered tome states, So it came that after ages of slavery, three proud men defied a deer, our god. They gave us a new sense of right and wrong. They told us how to live freely. Whether instruments, heaven sent by the god Aureus, divine manifestations themselves, or mere mortals is ambiguous, but these three beings, known to history as the judges, united in purpose. These demigods lifted humanity's banner and led a righteous crusade not just to rid themselves of Adir's tyranny, but to banish him completely from their realm, never again to let his influence stain hearts or minds. Much of the information relating the war against Adir is lost to myth, but tomes and artifacts suggest great carnage. Judge Warrior, possessed of indomitable strength, rallied soldiers against Rogar, his deeds memorialized in the bronze ring cast in his honor. The item description reads, Those who were present and survived never forgot that day near the climax of the war with a deer when the mighty Judge Warrior beat a Rogar lord to death with his bare hands. Judge Assassin worked alongside rogues to undermine Adir's network of spies and to silence from the shadows those loyal to him. Judge Cleric, once a devout follower of Adir, grew disillusioned with his lies and with the blessing of Holy Radiance exorcised Adir's twisted corruption alongside prelates and paladins. The three judges rose to a legendary status, their exploits passed on through generations in art, architecture, and chronicles. The Trinity Shield displays these imposing figures. Strangely enough, Judge Cleric was remembered through history as a male, which comes to us in the lore surrounding the Thorn Chalice. A few of the oldest recorded sources concerning the Judge's uprising against the deer, such as the Book of Justice, erroneously declared Judge Cleric to be male, a falsehood which gradually faded in time due to her ongoing prominence. Perhaps a minor correction to the storyline that permeated the original Lords of the Fallen game. As the fire came down, the judges didn't hesitate. They faced the Lords of the God. We all hid wherever we could, but they stayed and fought. When we came out of our hiding, the world was black and dead, but we were still alive, and we knew who we had to thank for it. This chronicler's recollection conjures vivid images of massacre and fear 
that consumed mortal realms in the war against the deer. Fields lay scorched, towns raised, innumerable masses on both sides of the conflict fell in battle. Regardless, the judges led humankind in ultimate, bloody victory against Rogar armies and drove their false god from the land, exiling a deer to his infernal lair. To ensure the deposed tyrant remained as such, oaths were made, rites were performed, and five mystical seals were erected with which humanity contained the demon. The five beacons of the sentinels pulsed with vibrant light, a beacon of man's triumph. The last remnant of the demon god's oppressive tyranny stands in the horizon as the hand of a deer mountains, a foreboding monument to his final defeat. Mortal had through will and sacrifice overthrown a god. The world would never be the same. The three judges, lauded as humanity's saviors, were remembered alongside their heroism for generations, but they themselves quickly disappeared into obscurity. With no purpose to unite them, the judges followed different paths. The fates of Judge Warrior and Assassin can only be guessed, but Judge Cleric remained to watch over the five beacons of holy radiance that maintained the magical seal on a deer's prison. Here, she established the holy order of the hallowed sentinels to preserve light root out corruption, and ensure the demonic god slumbered undisturbed. The judge's legacy acted as guide for humankind, now leaderless for the first time in centuries. A precarious future lay ahead of them, as one chronicler observes. Men cannot be for themselves. They need a leader. They need a guide. They will follow the light. When there is no light, they will only follow darkness. This light is manifest in the judges, or at least in their memory. Their descendants will go on to rule for many years, always striving to uphold the equity and equality embodied by the righteous demigods. It's here, perhaps, that the Church of Aureus grew to prominence. With Adir's old religion ruthlessly persecuted, a new spiritual source was required, a new image of divine intervention and salvation one that Aureus and the church assumed. A deer's deposition is not cause for all to rejoice, and the exile of a god by mortals sends existential shockwaves rippling throughout mankind. Just as with his arrival and purpose, two narratives arise surrounding the war against the demon god. One of a deer as a poisonous manipulator whose overbearing heel threatens to crush humankind entirely. The other, of a righteous God betrayed by his creation that has fallen into mortal sin and self-abasement. A priest of old admonishes those who attacked their deity. There is one heresy that can never be forgiven, and that is defying your true God. This sin is eternal and will haunt generations to come. While at the same time others rejoice. In the names of the judges, we will make this world whole again. Without the influence of a deer, it will be a life free from divine oppression. The truth, as with much of history, is far from clear. Regardless, mankind relishes its newfound freedom. Experimentations in trade, commerce, and governance yield thriving kingdoms beneath judge stewardship, while discovery opens a new age of exploration, magical and scientific ingenuity. Humanity enjoys a period of stability, a golden age free from oppression. But all suns must set, and twilight befalls humanity in the following centuries. With no external force to guide them, man falls prey to its own vices, avarice, deceit, desire. One individual, Antanas, a descendant of the judges and ruler of mankind, acts upon this vice and seeks his own immortality. He believes himself above others. His vanity knows no bounds. His hubris will bring ruin and be his undoing. This leader fears the demon god will return with his unstoppable Rogar legions. A journal entry gives us a glimpse into Antanas' mind as he notes his dread and need to prepare. They will come. I know they will. I know what will happen. 
I will do what needs to be done. Men are not strong enough to oppose them, so we need more than men. My elixirs are getting better, the beasts are getting stronger, but their will is hard to control, maybe impossible. But when everything else fails, what other choice will we have? Antanas sees in the defeated Adir, a god who failed, and wishes to replace the exile himself, so he conducts experiments to ascend to divinity. He concocts, researches, and tests on the poor and downtrodden dregs of society within his laboratory. Antanas' quest bears fruit. Indeed, power and vitality are bestowed, but at the cost of body and soul. He creates wretched, twisted abominations whose very existence is anathema to the natural order. Unbeknownst to him, Antanas' pursuit brings instability. Magic and infernal forces disrupt the barrier between worlds, stirs the exile of the deer from his slumber, and loosens his chains. The demon god, thus invigorated, strikes swiftly and with vengeance against his disobedient mortals sending his most capable Rogar lords to lay siege to the lands of men. The fallen lord sword grants insight to the power possessed by the superior demons. When Adir realized that the existing Rogar he had created would not be enough to defeat the judges, through great effort he created his lords, select Rogar of immense power who would stand at the head of his army. These lords of the fallen god lead legions of darkness and command the cult of a deer that still worships in shadow. War again consumes the realm as humanity pays for Antanas' transgression. Upon the scene of carnage, Harkin, a criminal with a dark past, arrives and an opportunity to repent is placed before him. If Harkin can stop Antanas from achieving godhood, if he can defeat the Rogar lords and cast a deer back into chains, then he will be cleansed of past mistakes, his soul redeemed from its wrongdoings. An arduous task lays before Harkin, and indeed all humanity, as profound existential questions come into focus. Are humans capable of self-governance? Can they contain the rancorous urges that dwell in their own hearts? Was a deer truly a god worthy of their devotion, or a vile tyrant, and should he be returned to his seat? These questions in Harkin's journey explore the moral gray that separates like a chasm, mortal from immortal. Whether a bridge can be fastened to cross the chasm is impossible to determine, but as Harkin confronts the Rogar lords, his conviction that Antanas' blasphemy must end grows indissoluble. In the crucible of decision, a deer himself approaches Harkin and sees a soul susceptible to manipulation. The god desires above all else to return to the mortal realm and once more invest himself as humanity's benevolent deity. To enact the ritual that will break the seal on the beacons of the sentinels requires sufficient power and magical potential. Power that now exists within the twisted soul of Antanas. The man's ambition for greatness transforms him into a grotesque mutant, a monstrous being of his own experimentation, no longer human but not yet God. A deer offers Harkin a pulsating rune born from his essence and whispers into the man's ears hollow promises, lies to manipulate and facilitate his return. If Harkin charges the rune of a deer with Antonis' essence, the God, reinstated in glory, will fulfill all his earthly desires. Temptation is great, but Harkin resists. In Antanas, he sees how lust for power destroys his soul. In a deer, he sees how empty is power once attained. Harkin instead resolves to follow the path of balance walked by the judges of old. He confronts and slays the monstrous Antanas, ending the man's internal anguish. His hand grips the rune of a deer, but he makes no move to use it, wrapping it instead beneath his cloak. With Antanas defeated and his unnatural experiments halted, the rift between realms is restored. The Rogar legions are pulled into their infernal plane, and Adir, the demon god, is once more firmly bound in eternal imprisonment. His rune of power, yet in Harkin's blood-stained grasp.
An indeterminate expanse separates the events of the original Lords of the Fallen from what transpires in the moments surrounding the second installment, but it's safe to assume many generations have passed. Adir, Harkin, the Judges and Rogar all fade into myth with the passage of time. The only reminder of their ancient defining battle, the foreboding hand of Adir that rises from the mountainous horizon. A reminder of valiance, temptation, power. Great kingdoms and empires rise as humankind dominates the mortal realm. Mornstead, nestled in the valley shadowed by the hand of Adir and encompassing the beacons of the sentinels, is a kingdom vested heavily in tradition, reminded constantly of the travails of that long ago age. From great industry and trade, its cities of Calrath, Kinringer, the Red Cops, enjoy the splendors of wealth while its noble kings administer Mornstead from within the court of Bramus Castle. The Church of Aureus, located beyond the horizon, has spread its religion far. Orion preachers proselytize the masses with passionate claims of salvation through Aureus' radiant embrace, and persecute those who turn their back to the light, especially those few who continue to worship the god imprisoned. As church influence grows, it establishes several religious and military orders to see Aureus' will enacted. Among these are the Ravagers, the Purifiers, Descriers of the Faith, and the Dark Crusaders. Their roles multiplex, their views disparate, all orders share in light's glory. The Dark Crusaders, however, are shrouded in suspicion and handled with trepidation. The church sees in everything a potential threat or potential weapon, including darkness. The unbearable dread of Umbral, a realm long lost with the fall of the Nohuta, is discovered with the uncovering of powerful artifacts known as Umbral lamps. These lanterns are inscrutable and charged with sinister abilities to revive the dead and walk between realms. Such dark sorcery is heresy to the church, but in the hands of justice, an indispensable weapon against evil. As Imperator Jacob states in Dark Crusader's Call, darkness is not to be feared, it is a weapon, and thus to be wielded. The lamps give rise to lamp bearers, and thus the Dark Crusaders, an order cursed with the terrible weight of sin to achieve good. Aureus Church extends far afield and is established as Mornstead's dominant religion. Its priors and preachers welcome into the fold the hallowed sentinels, who under the continued guidance of the last remaining judge of antiquity, Judge Cleric, have maintained their holy beacons. Mornstead's royalty is not oblivious to the conspicuity of their realm. The kingdom works in tandem with the hallowed sentinels, offering arms and armaments building fortresses and erecting abbeys for the sacred order. A unique social dynamism governs Mornstead and its surrounding fiefs wherein the king holds firmly the oaths of his liege lords, but allows hallowed sentinels significant independence, all while listening to counsel of an empowered church. This tentative balance holds an equilibrium for some time and humanity flourishes. But deep within the earth and beyond this plane of existence, a dark god stirs once more from slumber, a restless and vengeful force who in every passing moment gathers strength to precipitate his grim return. It's been centuries since the world has felt the terrible presence of a deer, the exiled god. His name is unfamiliar to most his deeds forgotten to time. The hallowed sentinels maintained a vigilant watch of the seals that bind him, but gods aren't so easily chained. From the fiery realm of chaos, a deer sets into motion grim machinations to resurrect his physical form and return to the land twice denied him. His past failure embittered a deer, but imparted a valuable lesson. As resilient humanity is to external assault, it is equally susceptible to internal manipulation. Base desires thrive in the depths of every soul. Emotions and passions that seethe in Deer's realm, so too royal in the hearts of men. 
all that's needed is deception and exploitation to twine such desires around his own ends, to unravel civilization. The demon gods fuses the land with his aura, infiltrates minds, and slowly spreads a corruption few can resist. A deer's malignancy manifests in various ways across the realm. A mysterious and virulent plague eats at Mornstead's citizenry. The hallowed sentinel infirmaries and church abbeys fill with the sick and dying. Bloodletting and prayers are thrown at the consuming infection to little effect as thousands expire. We see pestilence in the manse of the hallowed brothers. This stigma reveals Pieta of Blessed Renewal's discovery, the dark cause of the plague. You look exhausted, Pieta. Do you bring any better news? I'm afraid not, my lady. The number of those affected rises, and all my blood and our healing sorceries can do is offer temporary relief. And little at that, this disease is unnatural. And I believe I know why. My lady, I believe this corruption to be Rogar in nature. Impossible. The beacon stand and Adir and the Rogar remain imprisoned. I assure you, I continue tending to the ailing as best you can until you find the true cause of this malady. I have every faith in you. The Hallowed Sentinels deluded themselves. So afraid are they of a deer that they refuse to believe any mention of him or his terrible Rogar. As disease degrades bodies, minds are subject to relentless waves of Rogar energies that infiltrate the recesses of the psyche and lay bare demented abyss. Such atrocious transformation heard in the butcher armor tinked. Those unfortunate souls touched by the Rogar corruption inevitably grow twisted in both mind and body losing their grasp on whatever humanity they possessed, and succumbing to deranged, violent urges, maiming and butchering, and reveling in the agony of others. It's a frightening tale that gains purchase through much of Mornstead's countryside. Perception is shattered, consciousness obliterated, as thousands are gripped by the raving insanity of Rogar corruption. The hidden lore of corrupted pilgrim bandages paints a miserable image with little respite from damnation, even in the depths of religious piety. The strength of a pilgrim's faith has no bearing on which of them will fall prey to the Rogar corruption that plagues Mornstead, and no amount of prayer or radiant magic can heal the ravaging malady once a victim is infected. The masses look to their protectors for salvation but again, the hallowed sentinels refuse to see reason, refuse to look truth in the eye. They retreat to the cloistered protection of their sanctuaries, quarantine themselves both from reality and from the Rogar corruption that ravages Mornstead. And any discrier of the dawn found trespassing will be severely punished for their transgression. This place is now sanctified in the name of Judge Cleric and no longer a sanctuary for the ignorant and misguided. Please, this has been our own for generations. We've always kept our hearts open to the old sentinels. Be grateful that by Judge Cleric's mercy, you are allowed to leave with those wayward hearts still beating. Repent, and turn to her for salvation. Disquiet ripples through sentinel ranks who turn to each other for support and strength, who worry their greatest fear will manifest. It's this fear that acts as impetus for the launching of a brutally ruthless inquisition to expunge Adir's influence within their own and cleanse the masses of Rogar blight. All of Mornstead wallows beneath years of hallowed sentinel pandemonium, bloodshed, and oppression. To root out evil, it in turn becomes them. In dark alleys and clandestine meetings, the number of Adir's faithful, never completely dissolved, swells, driven either by his maddening influence or pushed through sentinel vulgarity. This stigma, deep within Kalrath's cistern, highlights a gathering of the demon's worshippers. My friends, I know the journey here was arduous, and that since arriving in Mornstead, we have suffered much. 
But take heart, for are we now not within reach of Adir himself? Do we not walk among the Rolga, our most holy brothers and sisters born of Adir's very own divine marrow? Those heretical servants of the betrayer, Judge Cleric, may have driven us into the shadows, but are we not used to being condemned and hunted simply for our beliefs? Rest assured, finally, the time of Adir's righteous return is nigh, and we who have remained faithful will be here to witness him usher in his glorious second reign. Mornstead is plunged into madness. Adir's miasma spreads. The indomitable Judge Cleric is herself vulnerable to his privations and sees threats lurking in every shadow. Further isolates herself behind castle walls and inflicts atrocity through her fallen sentinels. There's no salvation here. No redemption. Not for anyone. Let Moonstead and every meaningless life in it burn. Into this tainted land, a traveler, nameless, arrives cloaked in mystery. The Iron Wayfarer, a pseudonym meant to obfuscate the true identity of Harkin, hero of old, journeys to Mornstead and beseeches Judge Cleric. Aware of the growing threat and his ability to thwart it, he has in possession the ancient rune of Adir, and Harkin turns its custody over to the radiant cleric, hoping she will halt the demon god's return. Harkin's faith is as misplaced as his decision is misguided. Unable himself to use the ancient artifact against the demon god, he entrusts the rune of Adir to one of Adir's three chainers, Judge Cleric. But years of Rogar blight corrode the cleric's resolve, and corruption within the hallowed sentinel stokes paranoia, blindness, and panic. As powerful as his judge cleric, the rune of Adir burdens her beyond tolerance. Its malignant aura instills within her a madness that shatters the hallowed sentinels. It is temptation, and in her weakened state, she is unable to resist its alluring call. Judge cleric refuses to see reason is herself gripped with hysteria and withdraws with the rune to the Empyrean. One by one, the beacons of the sentinels scattered across Mornstead pulse with red, chaotic fervor tinged by a deer's malevolence. With each beacon stained, the seal binding the god loosens. Corrupted and weakened, with fewer sentinels standing vigil, their magic falters. Opportunity flashes again from the realm of Rogar, and the demon god seizes it. A deer tears the fabric of reality, and from the hot maw of his infernal realm, a Rogar army, innumerable and inexorable, pours forth. Mornstead is bathed in blood and fire. Demons, hellhounds, the bodies of the corrupted twisted beyond humanity, descend upon the kingdom as a deer's devout cult strikes from within. The sheer temerity of the Rogar is recounted in the lore of Rogar's Reach Polearm. In service to their creator, the Rogar do not falter or tire. They do not fear or doubt. Bramis Castle is besieged. Fitzroy's Gorge falls to ruiners and Rogar evils. A conflagration reduces Calrath City to smoldering ruin. Those among the military and hallowed sentinels untouched by corruption stand valiantly in the kingdom's defense, but are quickly overrun. Such horrors witnessed are heard in the flesh terror armor tinked. Some of those terrified survivors fortunate enough to escape Calrath following the Rogar invasion carried with them grisly tales of Rogar not only maiming and killing with their barbarous weapons, but in some cases tearing chunks of flesh from victims with their own claws. It is a nightmare from which most are unable to wake. The demon god's actions disrupt reality and reverberate with unforeseen consequences. The umbral realm, residence of all nightmares and creatures of death, lies transposed but imperceptible upon the realm of Axiom and separated by a fragile barrier. Holes emerge in locations where the barrier has been dissolved entirely by a deer's interference. Tears from which Umbral's horrifying abominations emerge to rend flesh from the living. 
The putrid mother, Umbral's dark god, exerts her influence upon minds undefended and shatters them entirely with overwhelming awe. She joins in the demon god's struggle to leave her own realm and feast upon Axiom, a dire threat that unfortunately goes unnoticed in the wake of Rogar invasion. Facing annihilation, Mornstead cowers in a deer's shadow as he prepares his long-anticipated return and exacts vengeance upon those who betrayed him. But in this bleakest abyss, a light shines. A hero of old is revived from beyond death and charged with significance. A dark crusader arrives and, armed with the umbral lamp, restores balance to Mornstead. has fallen, its great army decimated by the legions of Adir, the demon god. But one light still flickers in the ever-growing gloom, the light of the Dark Crusader. Rumors of Mornstead's corruption and blasphemy within the Hallowed Sentinels echo through the vaulted chambers of the Church of Aureus. It's a slight to the sanctity of his holiness, and such sin cannot go unpunished. Orion leaders task a contingent of Dark Crusaders to take holy oaths and seek truth in the hearsay. They must assess the extent of Mornstead's fall from light, excise heterodoxy within the Sentinels that conflicts with church teachings, and restore radiance to the land. Mornstead's years of fighting Rogar legions sees ravagers, harrowers, vanguards, prelates, apostates, all sects and weapons of the Divine Church intervene on its beleaguered behest. Dark Crusaders are called across the land to descend upon Adir's disciples, beckoned to exhaust all resources, including the antithetical umbral lamps, in their war against evil. Battles are fought, blood is spilled, thousands perish in conflict's conflagration. Many Crusaders fall without fulfilling their holy vow. A trio of crusaders embark on this harrowing mission. Only one, an exactor named Dunmire, endures dangers lurking. His companions fall to death or darkness. He requires a new sword of greatness to rise and finish the task. This is where the Deathless One's journey begins. Lo, the latest receiver of his grace. Great potential dwells within you, doubtless, for you to be chosen thusly. And so does Aureus' wisdom guide my hand in the bestowment of this subsequent boon. A hero of renown lost to ages past is resurrected by the Umbral Lamp and possessed with significance. They must journey through Mornstead's blighted land, cleanse the beacons of the Sentinels, now corrupted, and end Adir's calamitous return. But the demon god isn't blind to Orion's schemes, and sees the threat posed by lamp bearers. He creates his own champion, a twisted parallel to the Dark Crusader, the Light Reaper. As the hidden lore associated with Remembrance of the Light Reaper states, recognizing the threat represented by the lamp bearer mission, a deer was able to obtain one of the umbral parasites and bind it to a rogar, creating the Light Reaper a creature unaware of the suspicion and disgust with which he would always be regarded by his creator. The Light Reaper is relentless, a force that needs no rest and knows no mercy. Many lamp bearers that precede the Deathless One succumb to his onslaught, including Dunmire's companion, the Paladin Isaac. The Light Reaper's tenacity whittles hope as each lamp bearer's successive resurrection ultimately meets another painful, pitiful death. Many lamp bearers believe that their determination combined with the resurrective power of the Umbral Lamp would allow them to outlast the ruthless hounding of the Light Reaper, but every fresh death and resultant awakening in Umbral take their toll, while the Light Reaper never wanes in the hunt. It's into this world of desolation and depravity the Deathless One now steps. Besieged by demonic forces from without, and plagued by corruption within, the illustrious kingdom of Mornstead lies in ruin. Its castles are razed, its forces depleted, its people transformed into gruesome mockeries of life. 
The hallowed sentinels, convulsed by hysteric madness, know not friend from foe, see in all only sin requiring bloody castigation. As the Deathless One unlocks the kingdom's secrets, Mornstead's deplorable truth is realized. Corruption has eaten into the very bedrock of the Sentinels, whose high-ranking leaders have been twisted in body and mind to enact Adir's will. The Order's terrifying transformation reverberates within the Abbey of the Hallowed Sisters, where ungodly moans of sinister ecstasy permeate, and the air is thick with heresy. Pews run slick with blood, hands, arms, legs, bodies entire, bob in pools of gore or drip from hanging ceilings. Focal to the desecration is the rune of a deer, its vile influence plunging the sentinels beyond redemption. Not even the cleric, a mortal savior, demigod, and paragon of justice, is unaffected. The rune and rogar blight raise all internal screens, crush her will, and create in her an unwitting obedient, loyal to the demon god's whims. This severe heresy and tragic fall is made apparent when confronting her in battle, as Judge Cleric's radiant veneer is stripped to reveal true corruption beneath. Ensconced in Adir's grandeur, she wields his Rogar pyromancy to prevent the Deathless One access to the corrupted beacon she herself tarnished. The corrupted cleric set grants insight into her ultimate demise. Its hidden lore reads, The presence of the rune of Adir poisoned the mind of the cleric, as it did so many others, but by that time hers was already a mind in which watchfulness had become paranoia, faith had become fanaticism, and strength had become ruthlessness. While the pyroclastic stone spell gives us perspective on the lifetimes of decisions and consequences manifested in Mornstead's current turmoil. In a lifespan covering millennia, one's downfall might be both gradual and far indeed, and certainly the ancient and callous Judge Cleric, who stood atop the roof of a ruined kingdom, was but a twisted, unrecognizable shadow of her former self. It is this shadow the Deathless One must vanquish to restore stability to the land. What we are left with is the heart-wrenching pain Judge Cleric feels deep in some part of her psyche, the small sliver of her soul, free from a deer that realizes the extent of her failure, the atrocity committed against her own, and the depths to which she has plunged. Just as the leader of the Hallowed Sentinels has submitted to the demon god, so too has Mornstead's secular lordship been stained. Bramus the Seventeenth, king of Mornstead and defender of the faith, resides within the crumbling ruins of a castle that flows with lava and is studded with massive, crimson rogar crystals. Stern, indomitable, possessed of limitless vitality, Bramus inherited a Mornstead weakened by his forefathers but demonstrated flashes of diplomatic and military brilliance to restore its glory. When a deer unleashed his Rogar minions, Bramus donned sword and shield to defend his kingdom with inimitable guile. Orchestrating relief, giving battle to demons, Bramus embodied his nobility, but not even royal blood is impervious to a god's perversion. I can't help but envy his ability to sleep so soundly. It soothes him having you near, and I know how exhausted you are. This sickness... Can wait. The situation with those fanatics is precarious, and every day it seems the knife's edge on which Mornstead rests becomes thinner. I won't allow my weakness to be the ruination of my kingdom. It's not weakness, Bramus. You know that. My love. Please. Not now. Let us just... Enjoy the moment. 
The Rogar corruption gripped Bramus early and manifested as mental affliction. Bouts of derangement and hysteria followed by overwhelming melancholy left the king enfeebled to his duty. By scrutinizing the lore of the heavy memento shield, we hear that King Bramus the 17th did his best to do right by his homeland, his people, and the ones he loved. His efforts eventually cut short by a cruel sickness of the mind. This mental sickness doubtless adheres corruption. The self-important demon god will not share his regnal opulence with any mortal, especially those that stylize themselves as monarchs. He attacks Bramus with hysterical visions and shatters the king's mind before commanding his earthly body. Bramus's fall from Wornstead Defender to Deranged Supplicant is suggested from the Lord Mask found atop the king's bed in the castle's private chambers. Its hidden lore reads, Despite the tremendous bitterness he felt towards humanity as a whole, a deer remained open to the possibility that one day a human would prove themselves suitably powerful and obedient enough to become one of his new lords. Such a human he may find in Bramus. The king undergoes ungodly transformation into a monarch sundered by infernal influence. Mornstead swiftly follows ruination. The once great king, his clarity and conviction dissolved, is twisted into a deer's fallen lord responsible for beckoning the god from beyond and destroying his prison entirely. A task underway in the castle's throne room where sits a deer's effigy when the deathless one arrives. A sliver of Bramus's former self lives on perhaps within his mind, as this stigma shows the king resisting waves of aggressive Rogar assault. Mornstead, the hallowed sentinels, the world of mortals, sit on a knife's edge, their fates placed completely in the hand of the unlikely hero. Three endings to this tale lay before the Deathless One and depend upon actions taken throughout the major quest line. Each of these endings is connected to one of the three gods, Adir, Aureus, and the Putrid Mother, the consequences of the deity's will unleashed upon mortal lands. As there's no sequel following, no ending is considered canon the fate of Mornstead left to speculation. The radiant ending follows the divine path prescribed by the Church of Holy Aureus. In this, the Deathless One, tenacious and heroic, resists temptation and succeeds in cleansing all five sentinel beacons of a deer's impiety. With his prison thus strengthened, the demon god is himself consumed by the umbral lamp. As light pierces a deer's body, the Deathless One is made a martyr, engulfed and sacrificed, oblivion's peace their just reward. The Inferno ending follows the Deathless One's path toward becoming a deer's most trusted lord. They spur the light in favor of chaos. With the rune of a deer in their possession, they humbly approach the altar of their divine lord erected within Bramus Castle. Here, a deer blesses and invigorates the rune. Now imbued with the strength to sever the ties binding him, a deer charges the Deathless One with twisting the corrupt hallowed sentinel beacons beyond reclamation, with obliterating them through runic magic. Freed from exile for the first time in millennia, 
a deer relishes in the liberty won through devious machinations. For ultimately, even more so than his desire for vengeance upon those who had wronged him, a deer wanted one simple thing, to go home. With his utmost desire secured, revenge again becomes paramount. Ezel, the judge cleric, is the last of a deer's betrayers, and the god has one final torment to deliver her. Ezel's soul is cast into internal imprisonment as her body is made a vessel to a deer's will. Through possession of Judge Cleric, the god physically manifests into the world, his enemy forever dominated by his persona. With the deer restored entire, he confers onto the Deathless One title of first in a new generation of Rogar lords to rule over humanity. The final ending sees the Deathless One embrace not a deer nor the Church of Aureus, but the cold void of Umbral and its rapacious deity, the Putrid Mother. The putrid mother's power cannot be overstated. The demon god himself feared what calamity would ensue if she were unleashed upon the mortal realm of Axiom. And as the withered rune of Adir states, although the fact is far more apparent and maddening while in the umbral realm, those with enough umbral knowledge know that whatever the realm, the putrid mother is always watching. Now her watch is over. Now the time for action. The Putrid Mother is a force of insatiable hunger and overwhelming dread, in whose presence sanity, light, life all fade into the bottomless abyss. The barrier keeping her from Axiom wears thin, ravaged by a deer's roar. Deep in Mornstead's caverns and guarded by the uncompromising Harrow or Dervla, lies an ancient Nohuta shrine that surrounds a bridge to Umbral. By slaying the pledged knight and her child charge, the Deathless One gains audience with the god in Mother's Lull. Now pledged to this bringer of cataclysm, the Deathless One works through Malhu, last of the Nohuta, to finalize what will dissolve entirely the veil between realms, thus allowing the putrid mother to feast on the warm glow of the living. So long have I awaited your embrace. After harvesting the life essence and umbral parasites of those marked by the god, worthiness is bestowed. Before the putrid mother, they sacrifice themselves, complete the ritual, and consign all axiom to a terrible fate. The hungering mother lurches forth, consuming light, time, reality, in grim oblivion. So ends the tale of Lords of the Fallen, a sweeping epic recounting struggles against tyranny, the dangers of hubris, and the destruction in vengeance. It's a tale of millennia, of conflict, tumult, resignation, but always lined with the flickering light of hope, the promise of peace. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this video on the complete Lords of the Fallen story. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on the judges, on a deer and the putrid mother, as well as your own insights and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of Lauren's storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. I want to thank my amazing supporters over on Patreon, who make all of this possible, and I couldn't do it without their fantastic support. If you'd like to become a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, head to patreon.com slash the librarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.